the fifth kind. Check out our official website at fifthkind.tv. The idea of ET human abduction and hybridization seems so out there, seems so extreme, that we really struggle to do business with it and process it. But as soon as you go to the world's mythologies, to our ancestral narratives, you realize that that is probably one of the most widely recurring themes of all our ancient stories of ET contact. Before we get into it, our thanks to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. VPNs, virtual private networks, are a really useful tool for protecting your privacy and securing your personal details online. Surfshark VPN is a service that protects your information by encrypting all the data that you send through the internet, keeping anyone unwanted from seeing it. Along with privacy and security, Surfshark VPN offers the ability to change your location with the click of a button, allowing access to sites, features, and streaming services otherwise restricted to certain locations. Get fully protected. Follow the link in the description, sign up, and use the promo code FIFTHKIND to receive an 85% discount. Plus, you'll get three months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you try it and you don't like it, you can easily cancel your subscription and receive a full refund. With Surfshark, you can swim under the radar in the sea of online content. The ancient narrative of human ET hybridization is probably best known from the story of the Bible. It is told in Genesis 6 when the Bene Elohim, ones like the powerful ones, come down to planet Earth to abduct human females. Their interbreeding produces a lineage called the Nephilim, the giants of legend. The author of Genesis 6 in the Hebrew canon and the author of the letter of Jude in the New Testament both assume that their readers are familiar with another famous text, the Book of Enoch, a text to be found today in the Ethiopian Orthodox canon of the Bible. The book describes the abductions referenced in Genesis 6 in even greater detail. It names those doing the abducting as watchers and describes how they had transgressed fundamental ethics governing relationships with the human race arriving from somewhere among the stars to begin their program of producing hybrid offspring. Josephus, the Jewish historian of the first century of the Common Era, appeals to this scriptural episode to explain the presence of giants in his own day, as well as through the annals of history. Josephus understood the Jewish tradition to be only one iteration of this legend of human hybridization with advanced beings. Specifically, Josephus identifies the ancient Greek legends as vehicles of the same memory. The Greek name for these hybrids was Titans. These strange notes sound again in ancient Indian, Norse and Celtic narratives. Ancient Egyptian and Native American traditions hint at something similar. The Luo people of Kenya have curated the story of Nyamgodhu Wod Umbare. It tells of a man, Nyamgodhu, a Bantu man of the Waturi tribe, who lived in the 14th and 15th centuries in the village of Nyandiwa, in the Suba district of Kenya, on the shores of Namlolwe, Lake Victoria. One morning, so the story goes, he found a strange-looking woman caught in one of his fishnets. The fisherman agrees to marry the woman and live with her because she convinces him that she can bring wisdom and prosperity to him. And this she does. But she gives him one condition, that he must never speak of her true place of origin from under the water. The woman's underwater origins, her promise of advancement, and the aspect of human hybridization all sound some familiar notes. In Kenya, 
The Mamiwata are known as the Jini, which is the Swahili equivalent of the Jinn of the Arabic peoples. These are all narratives that precede the official mainstream religions of these people groups. These are stories that are carried by folk memory and passed on from generation to generation in the form of oral tradition. Elements of Mamiwata repeat in the indigenous Philippine story of the Encantos. The Encantos are shape-shifting entities associated with the water. Their humanoid appearance is almost identical to our own. Indeed, they could almost pass for regular Filipinos, save for their unusual skin color and the lack of a philtrum on the upper lip. The Encantos were also associated with abducting human beings who get too close. The Philippine word diwatas is another word that invokes ancestral knowledge of non-human entities who abduct human beings. The diwatas are often referred to in whispered conversations as dili ingonato, which means those unlike us, or lamangdagat, which means those who dwell under the sea. These strange duatas were physical beings, similar enough to humans, to be able to procreate with those they take in order to create hybrid people. The very fact that such specialized language exists to tell the story shows you how important retaining this memory has been to Philippine culture. In fact, the word diwatas shows that the Philippine story has Indian roots because it's derived from a Sanskrit word of Devatas. And that word refers to a higher being or God. In a similar vein, the Vodou tradition of Haiti speaks of Simbi Nandlo, the spirit of the water. African slaves brought the tradition to the Caribbean with the name Yumoya. Some of the words belonging to these traditions are incredibly intriguing. They have associations with spirits and serpents, and just like the word Elohim in the Hebrew stories, they can often be translated to mean either a god or a demon. When we look at some of the vocabulary, it can refer to a higher being, a god, a demon. Sometimes there are serpent associations, now that might seem like a funny ambiguity, but it's a gentle reminder to us that these narratives long predate the arrival of the official religions that now control the narrative over those people groups. These stories of E.T. abduction and hybridization are ages old. Now some might say, oh, you're reading these stories too literally. And my answer is this, people read mythologies in different ways. Some people want to read them as moral stories. To be honest, the morals that emerge from some of these stories, if you try and read them that way, don't make a lot of sense. Some like to read them in a fundamentalist kind of way, where every detail, that's true, that's science, that's history, that's exactly what happened. My question when I hear these ancient narratives is what memory are these stories carrying. Some might say perhaps they're carrying the memory of slave trafficking, the human slave trade, because all these regions where these stories are told are coastal regions. They would have all had some experience of human slave trading. Perhaps this is just a mythologized memory of that. For me, that explanation doesn't hold a lot of water because whether you're talking about Mamiwata, Yamoya, the Gini, the Jin, the Encantos, the Diwatos, Dili Ingonato, and La Mangdagat. Mami Water abductions and the stories in that lineage tell of people being abducted from near the water, taken to bases under the sea by beings who look human but aren't really human. The people are held there only for a short time and are returned unharmed, sometimes even more healthy than when they went away, other than that they have been exploited for a hybridization program. Now that is not the pattern of the human slave trade. That's not the pattern 
of human slave trafficking. It's a different pattern. Jane Pooley is a retired nurse and mother of three from New South Wales. In the words of Ida Batrose, she is a mild and unassuming woman. When in 2018 she appeared on national television on Australia's Studio 10, her claims took the audience by surprise. Her name is Jane Pooley and she sat down with Ita to not only share her beliefs, but also put them to the test. Her claim is that she is a lifelong experiencer of extraterrestrial visitations. She also claims to have been used by her visitors as part of a program of human ET hybridization and to have produced hybrid children who were taken from her mid-term. Before the interview on national television for Australia's Studio 10, Jane presented the show's team with medical documentation evidencing her pregnancies, along with other objective indicators of her story. The team then invited her to take a polygraph test to be quizzed on the key elements of her story, to which Jane readily agreed. There are three important questions. Did you meet an alien? Do you have part alien children? Have you been part of an alien breeding program? Jane Pooley underwent the polygraph test three times. And the result? No deception was indicated. Jane Pooley certainly isn't the first person to come forward with an abduction story. In modern times, probably the most widely known and earliest story would be that of Betty and Barney Hill from 1961. But what was so interesting to me listening to Jane Pooley was that here was a lady speaking on national television in Australia and being given a respectful, dignified hearing by Ita Buttrose, who's an absolute pillar of Australian society. Ita Buttrose is a national icon. She's a celebrated journalist and editor. She was the pioneering editor for Clio magazine. And as a popular figure in Australia's media, she feels like part of everybody's family. In 2018, she was appointed as the new chair of Australian ABC, the national broadcaster. So to see her in conversation with Jane Pooley and for it to be such a respectful, dignified interview was really quite startling. I mean, only a generation ago, Australian 60 Minutes was examining the work of Professor John Mack. Now, he'd been commissioned by US Defense to assess the psychological reliability of Defense Force personnel who were reporting close encounters or abduction experiences. And US Defense wanted to know, are they sane? Are they safe to fly? And they were so concerned by the problem that they went to the top authority they could think of in the field of psychology, the head of Harvard's Department of Clinical Psychology and Pulitzer Prize winner, Professor John Mack. He assessed more than 50 Defense Force personnel and personnel from civil aviation who had reported similar experiences. And he concluded that psychologically, they were quite sound. No pathology was indicated. And furthermore, that his method had revealed that what they had reported was something objectively real. Now, it was a controversial report. And a generation ago, the simple fact that Professor Mack had drawn that conclusion gave Richard Carlton, the 60 Minutes reporter, reason enough to sit in front of him and declare him off with the pixies. He said to his face, Harvard professor or not, anyone who believes what you do would believe anything. And he dismissed Professor Mack's case studies, all those 50 people that he'd studied as off the planet, probably crazy, out of their tree. What Richard Carlton's qualifications were in clinical psychology, I'm not quite sure. So by contrast, to hear Jane Pooley talk about not only ET contact, but abduction, not only abduction, but involvement in an ET human hybridization program on national television, and to be given a respectful hearing by Ita Buttrose, suggested to me that our culture has shifted. The land of my fathers on my mother's side is Wales, and Wales 
is not without its fair share of stories of ET contact and abduction. Pembrokeshire may seem like a sleepy part of Wales, but through the decades, it has enjoyed more than its fair share of otherworldly encounters. Over the last 20 years, the Milford Haven estuary has enjoyed a great number of sightings of unexplained aerial phenomena, or UFOs. In the 1970s, Pembrokeshire was plagued with unearthly visitations as the epicenter of what became known as the Welsh Triangle. Several books were written reflecting on the strange phenomena. The Welsh Triangle in 1979, The Doveth Enigma by Pugh and Holiday in 1981, The Uninvited by Clive Harold in 1979, and The Alien World, Orbis Books 1984. These documented cases with multiple witnesses, close encounters of the second and third kinds, meaning that both craft and entities were observed, interacting with their surroundings and with those who saw them. My friend and colleague G.L. Davies, the horror writer, has made a study of some of these cases and has a new book coming out later this year that examines an abduction case. Now, for there to be such a concentration of UFO experiences, ET encounters, in as small a district as Pembrokeshire, suggest to me that if we were to extend that search across the British Isles, across Europe, around the world, we would have more stories to tell than we could ever have imagined. The land of my fathers on my father's side is Ghana, West Africa. And Ghana has a long tradition of stories of ET human abduction and hybridization, and it's called the Mamiwata tradition. Mamiwata is a tradition so old that in some places it has morphed into a kind of religious or spiritual practice. The religious version of the story sees Mamiwata as a female entity with power over the seas. Not necessarily dangerous, but so superior in power that you would not want to get on the wrong side of her. Mamiwata is a tradition carrying the report for hundreds and maybe thousands of years of human abductions. The purpose of these abductions, so the tradition tells us, is a program of hybridization. A curious element of the Mamiwata stories is that the abductee is often taken with a promise that they will be returned healthier and more intelligent than when they were taken. The name Mamiwata dates from the British occupation of the Gold Coast which was to become Ghana in 1950 when it gained its independence. But the tradition is far older and goes back hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. One aspect of the Mamiwata tradition is this story of people being abducted for a short time and then return home unharmed other than having been used in a hybridization program. And the people who do the abducting live in bases under the sea. It's a very unlikely kind of story, and yet it recurs across a very broad region on planet Earth from the southernmost tip of Africa, in South Africa, all the way up the western seaboard of Africa into the Caribbean, to Brazil, Cuba, Haiti, and as far east as the Philippines. Even today, the idea of ET human abduction and hybridization seems so out there, seems so extreme, that we really struggle to do business with it and process it. But as soon as you go to the world's mythologies, to our ancestral narratives, you realize that that is probably one of the most widely recurring themes of all our ancient stories of ET contact. How could a testimony so widespread, carried by so many diverse cultures and traditions around the world, remain so unknown? In the West of the 21st century, 
when people like Jane Pooley claim to have experienced an abduction at the hands of something non-human, we react as if we'd never heard the like before. A survey of the world's mythologies and ancestral narratives reveals that the like has been told us since time immemorial. But is our culture shifting? As for the first time since 1947, the Pentagon admits to having departments investigating UFO cases. Are we reaching a place where we can listen to today's narratives as well as ancient mythologies? I'm a great enthusiast for world mythology and ancestral narratives. If we can give our attention to the memories curated by the world's indigenous peoples, narratives full of stories of abduction by others and hybridization with others, if we familiarize ourselves with what our ancestors have told us, then maybe we can listen to contemporary accounts of abduction and hybridization more respectfully and with a more open ear. Thank you for watching The Fifth Kind TV. Remember to subscribe and click on the bell for notifications so that you never miss when we upload new content. For uncensored access to our full interviews and documentaries, go to fifthkind.tv. For more videos about paleo contact and the wisdom of the world's ancestral narratives, go to the Paul Wallace channel, subscribe and click on the bell. You can join the Paul Wallace channel for a regular live stream and live conversation. Thank you for watching The Fifth Kind TV. Author and researcher Paul Wallace probes the world's ancient mythologies for clues about the origins of the human race and has published several books in the field of mysticism and spirituality. In the last decade, his work has probed the world's ancient mythologies for the insights they hold on our origins as a species and our potential as human beings. Paul's work in church ministry has included training pastors in the interpretation of biblical texts, working as a troubleshooter for communities of faith, and serving as an Archdeacon in the Anglican Church in Australia. Endorsed by George Norrie and Eric Von Daniken, Paul Wallace's latest book, Echoes of Eden, explores what secrets of human potential were buried with our ancestors' memories of ET contact. From Senate briefings in Washington, D.C., to secret ceremonies in Southern Africa, from strange phenomena in Australia and Iraq, to mysterious encounters in modern Brazil and ancient Greece. Echoes of Eden will take you around the globe to discover why military, intelligence, and other government agencies are so interested in archaeology, indigenous rituals, and traditional initiation practices. What is the connection between higher cognitive powers like remote viewing and precognition and ET contact in the deep past? And what are the implications for us today? Echoes of Eden, out now. Available on Amazon. Follow the links in the description. Go to www.paulanthonywallace.com for information about Paul and his books.